there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tepalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tepalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. TEFL News. This episode's TEFL News is about a recently published article, came out this year, uh, in Applied Linguistics. It's called Research Trends in Applied Linguistics from 2005 to 2016, a Bibliometric Analysis and its Implications. So this is a study by Lei and Liu, I think. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, I would guess. Okay. I always look at you, because you... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, with Chinese, I have... You know, no idea, basically. Okay, fair enough. Well, apologies to the authors if that's <laughs> wrong. Um, so this is a study um, of changing trends in uh, applied linguistics journals. Um, and as, as I said in the title, it's a bibliometric analysis, which uh, basically um, involves them kind of collecting lots of data mm -hmm. uh, from these journals, looking at citation indexes and stuff like that, um, and then compiling all that data mm. and analysing it to get trends. Right, right. Um, trends in the, the topics that they look at? So trends in the topics that they look at, trends in... Well, there, there are four things that they, that they uh, checked, which I'll, I'll summarise each mm -hmm. in turn. Um, so this data was drawn from 42 journals, which met a variety of criteria that mm -hmm. the authors established, um, and a total of 10,028 articles. Right. <laughs> um, so... The, uh, the four things that they were looking for first, um, the most frequent terms, so uh, the most frequently explored topics over that time and how that changed over time, mm -hmm. um, the most highly cited publications, mm -hmm. uh, the most highly cited authors, um, and the most productive countries and regions. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are some issues with, with some of this, which I'll talk about later, but we'll maybe just go through each of the four uh, sets of findings okay. in turn. Um, so first of all, the most frequently explored research topics. Yeah. Um, so there have been changes from 2005 to uh, 20, <laughs> 2016. Yeah. Um, what would you imagine those changes are? What was more <coughs> uh, commonly explored in 2005 and how has that changed in 2016? You mean what's gone down or what's gone up? Both. Well, mm. I would have said there'd be a development in like computer assisted language learning mm -hmm. i think back in 2005 it wasn't i mean we had the internet then but it's uh <laughs> yeah it's developed <laughs> since then so mm -hmm. i would have thought that would be something maybe right. okay maybe like some critical issues elf non-native speakers that kind of stuff mm. so what, what makes you say that uh just from my own maybe, maybe it's you know just connected to my own uh things that i've looked at but i feel like those are Mm. issues that have yeah. become more prevalent yeah. in general in the field. I don't read a lot of uh, um, journals and stuff, but mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. well actually I think you're, uh, you're both pretty close. So um, the things that increased were topics including language policy, language mm -hmm. ideology, mm -hmm. social class, and English as a lingua franca. Mm -hmm. Topics that decreased, any mm -hmm. ideas? Maybe more like grammar, linguistic so, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sentence level stuff, I guess. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mo so, motivation? <laughs> ah, ah, okay, no, that's interesting. That's my, my hope. <laughs> I, I, I would have said motivation would have changed rather than decrease. Changed in what way, though? Well, I would have expanded. Would have... Because I think, like, with these, like, motivation, they're always trying to look for new angles, new ways to describe it, and mm. maybe that would have... Descriptions uh, okay. would have changed. Mm -hmm. It's like with uh, teacher cognition. I think that's that's expanding all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you're, you're right about the grammatical kind of points. Um, mm -hmm. Decreases occurred in uh, research into things like phonological awareness, mm -hmm. overt subject, object shift, things like that. So, basically... Um, it seems researchers have become more interested in sociocultural and language policy related issues mm -hmm. and less interested in formal linguistic issues mm -hmm. or the learning of formal linguistic issues. Yeah. Um, how about in terms of research methods, what do you think has changed? Hmm. 
maybe a general shift to more qualitative yeah. research methods? Uh, yeah, mix more mixed methods, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm. Is that, again, um, based on your kind of intuitions of uh, reading? Yeah, g- yeah, but also yeah. maybe connected to the, the, the change in the topics that people were looking at. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's what I would have expected as well. But mm-hmm. um, actually, what, what seems to have increased is mention of things like eye tracking and mobile devices. Uh, right, okay. So more yeah, connected yeah. with mm-hmm. uh, you know the technological advances that you were talking about. I was going to say back then, extensive reading as well. And that kind of falls in line with eye tracking, which I've, they probably use, don't they, for mm. reading, testing reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they also say the significant mm-hmm. increase of ELF, mm-hmm. which you mentioned... Uh, might be a result of today's much more globalised world with a much higher need for ELF. Mm. But I would suggest it might also be because there's a journal called English as a Lingua Franca, <laughs> which probably mentions that like a thousand times in every issue. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was included as one of those, but I think, yeah, I, I, I think that it's just an area that's a bit more trendy, I would guess, rather than it being reflective of the changing nature of English in the last mm. 13 years. Mm. I would agree, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, Okay, so the most highly cited publications is the next section. And these are actual particular... Particular publications. What would you guess are the most highly cited publications? Yeah, I mean, which which countries are we talking about? Like, it's hard to know because I mean, China probably has a lot of articles. Was this in this study or? Uh, it's well, journals? they weren't looking at articles I mean, by jo- country. Yeah. They were looking at journals. The, right. The journals right. are all international index oh, okay. journals. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there is there is something about countries later on, as I said, but yeah. um, um, this is just in general the the, the most cited topics or the most cited publications. Well, is the journal that you're reading from in there? Uh, well, again, we're talking about specific Actual, articles right, okay. or books. Any ideas? No. no. Okay, well, they're split into three sections, 2005 to 2008, 2009 mm-hmm. to 2012, 2013 to 2016. So I'll go through the, um, the top five of okay. each of those. Um, so 2005 to 2008, number one, The Minimalist Program by Chomsky. Okay. Number two, The Role of Consciousness in Second Language oh, Learning yeah. by Schmidt. Schmidt. Uh-huh. Schmidt. <laughs> number three, Mind in Society by Vygotsky. Uh-huh. Mm. Number four, Attention by Schmidt. Right. Uh, number four, I guess joint number four, Communicative Competence, uh-huh. uh, Swain. Yeah. Um, and mm. number... Oh, sorry, that should be number five. There's a typographical error in the journal. Hmm. Um, <laughs> 2000, <laughs> 2009 to 2012, number one, The Minimalist Programme, Noam Chomsky. Number two, Mind in Society by Gotsky. Number three, The Longman Grammar of Spoken and Written English. Oh. Uh, number four, Introduction to Functional Grammar by the late Michael Halliday. Uh-huh. Uh, and number five, A Cognitive Approach to Language Learning by Skihan. Okay. Uh, and 2013 to 2016, number one, The Common European Framework by the Council of Europe. Yep. Number two, Mind in Society by Vygotsky. Uh-huh. Uh, number three, Longman Grammar of Spoken and Written English. Number four, Introduction to Functional Grammar. And number five, The Psychology of the Language Learner by Dornier. Ah, okay. You would be in there somewhere. Yeah. Yes. So, as you can see, mm, the minimalist program, number one for the yep. first two sets, and then it drops right down to number six. Yeah, okay. Um, from 2012 to... From 2012 yeah. to 2000, well, yeah, yeah. 2013 to 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would okay. seem to to match up with the, the lack of focus on formal mm. linguistic... Mm. Yeah, and also maybe the... Revisionist, the 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 new look people are taking at Chomsky. Mm, right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but it's, I mean, what is interesting is that they're kind of, I guess, I mean, it's, I mean, it's obvious, but there's big names in there, mm. um, including papers by big names um, that were written a long time ago. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, the although the numbers change a little bit, the uh, there are several common points. So, for example, nations uh, learning vocabulary in another language. That's in all three lists. Yeah. Um, and Swales, I think, is in all three lists. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so there, there are, as you say, kind of big names, common common themes in all three. Yeah. Um, but the focus does seem to change, especially mm. as we move into the 2013 to 2016 period. One mm-hmm. question I had is, <clears throat> obviously you can still reference articles that you don't fully agree with, mm. but you can reference articles as a way to take the argument away from those. Yeah. Did this meta biographical analysis take that into account uh, or no, just sheer it, mention of or? yeah i think it's it's just focusing on how 
uh, how often something is cited as a measurement of how influential it was. And of course, influential can m- include people disagreeing with it, I guess. Oh, okay, yeah, not sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so the authors uh, say that this tends to suggest a likely decline in the interest in generative theories, but an increased interest in functional, sociocultural, and socio psychological issues in applied linguistics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's also uh, an increase in bilingual education, corpus linguistics, language policy, usage-based language acquisition theories, and the role of explicit knowledge in language acquisition. Um, Next, the most highly cited authors over this period. What would you guess who the most highly cited authors? Well, surely it would be... uh, (laughs) Chomsky and Vygotsky. Yeah. And whoever wrote the long and... uh, Yeah. I think think some of the big, you know, Swain would probably be in the Meryl Swain. Mm -hmm. Um... uh, yeah. Maybe Rod Ellis, maybe I'd throw in it, throw him in. Crashing, yeah, crashing, yeah. Peter Skeen. So, yeah. uh, you you you've touched on some of the names. Um, so Rod Ellis, number one. Okay. Chomsky, number two. Uh-huh. Swain, number three. Dornier, number four, mm-hmm. and Ken Highland, number five. Mm. After that, you've got Mike Long, Nick Ellis, uh, Bieber, Bialystok, Schmitz, Halliday, uh, Vygotsky is number nineteen. Uh, how many of them are female? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Mer- Meryl, that's a female uh-huh. name, but I don't uh, think... Gas is female. Meryl Swain is female. Right, okay, so that's... Gas is okay. female. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how that's changed over time as well. Uh, right. Not very much, apparently. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. two or three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, it's on... Oh, Batty Alpha. Oh, yeah, of course. Mm, so, yeah. Former interviewee. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's something. Our incredibly sexist profession should be <laughs> citing women more. There was, There is research that shows papers written by men get cited more than papers by women. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think they've yeah. they've done experiments with um, the you know the, the nebulous they. Uh, I think they've done experiments with uh, sending off the same paper or publishing the same paper with male or female names, mm-hmm. and it gets more citations with a male name. Yeah. Um, so finally, uh, the most productive countries and regions. What do you think? Um, what's the difference between a country and a region? Uh, oh, you mean uh, the two different lists? One no, no, no. It's one. just, it's just. You know, okay. I'd, I'd, places I'd, I'd maybe exist. put Japan on that. Maybe because there's a lot of research in Japan, certainly with motivation and like task based mm. language mm-hmm. learning. Right, right. I mean, I would guess you know U.S., Australia, U.K. But mm. well, uh, the U.S.A. is still number one, mm-hmm. um, but it's decreased from thirty eight point five three percent to uh, in two thousand five two thousand eight to thirty one point four nine percent. And to 29.49% in 2013 to 2016, so almost 10% down, mm-hmm. whereas China has increased Ooh. its share quite mm-hmm. a lot. But the authors note that China here includes Taiwan and Hong Kong as special administrative regions, mm-hmm. so a lot of this research is actually done in Taiwanese and Hong Kong universities, mm-hmm. which boosts China's overall score. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think this is an interesting study. Mm. Um, it tells us a little bit about changing research trends. Um, the only issue that I really had with it was the question of citations. Mm. Like, how are we assessing uh, different areas of applied linguistics just on raw citation counts? Because it seems to me that different subjects have different citation practices, right? That, so subjects that are more natural science focused tend to cite other papers more. They do more kind of black boxing. So mm. you see papers... Like, um, in the uh, Becoming and Being an Applied Linguist book, one of the authors, uh, who is a language tester, said, oh, here, this paper that I published it only got 158 citations, so it can hardly be called influential. Whereas some, you know, quite well-respected papers in, you know, the more critical applied linguistics area maybe have, you know, 50 citations or less. Mm-hmm. So I think just doing raw citation counts of applied linguistics as a whole is possibly a bit misleading because different fields cite differently and cite less or you know what do you think i think that's the trouble with this kind of study like the study of the the research method that this paper used mm. it can only tell you it's like qualitative and quantitative data they're going to tell you different story not different stories but different um sides of the coin maybe mm. the same side maybe yeah like I think, like it would be a much more interesting study to, like, like Matt said, look into conferences, attend these conferences, and kind of document the changes that you see going on around you. Maybe over time, mm. I don't know. Possibly, yeah. you yeah. can triangulate it with some other. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That sort of data. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, certainly this is useful as well. Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts about that? 
well, the citation issue? Um, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I think it, it, it gives you a general picture maybe, but mm. yeah, like you say, it can't, it can't go into the details of those different fields. Mm. Yeah. Another point was the, um, the regional and country-based uh, points. Mm -hmm. So they, the authors actually mentioned this. They kind of say very quickly, you know, obviously there are issues in terms of rating scholars from different countries because different countries have different access to resources and funding and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sorry, the, in terms of identifying the different regions or countries, how was that done? I mean, you, you said the journals are all international. So where the scholars are based who submitted the articles. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I wonder how they decide. I mean, a, a lot of these scholars, like somebody like Ellis is based in right, three different right. countries, you know. I wonder, I wonder which that's country true. they assigned for him. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure, mm. actually. Maybe they should be looking where the, if, if this is a, re if these are, these aren't all research articles, I guess. Mm -hmm. but where the oh, they are all research articles. Okay. So okay. Where, where is the research conducted? Mm -hmm. Could you look into that as well? Mm -hmm. Possibly so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that like they, they, as I said, they mention this, but they don't really. They they just say, be aware of this, rather than this is a serious issue for, mm -hmm. the, you know, um, because ranking countries based on their scholarship output doesn't take into account, you know, the USA of course is number one because they plow loads of money in scientific research. China as well is plowing a lot of money in scientific research. Uh, scholars from other countries don't have that uh, the opportunity to do as much research because they don't have the funding and the resources. And so it's a little bit problematic to kind of rate or rank scholars on the basis of their output in this way, in this purely kind of tabulated way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's another another issue to maybe consider for people reading the article. Um, but yeah, I think this is uh, an interesting study that uh, tells us a little bit about how research in our field is heading. Um, and that's this episode's TEFL News. TEFL Cultures. So this episode's TEFL culture is uh, action research. Okay. Uh, so the term action research uh, was coined by Kurt Lewin, mm -hmm. um, then a professor at MIT in 1944. Um, his 1946 paper uh, called Action Research and Minority Problems uh, was where he described action research. So he described it as, quote, a comparative research on the conditions and effects of various forms of social action and research leading to social action, um, which I think maybe is more specific to the, the field that he was working in. Um, but he also pointed out that he uses, quote, a spiral of steps, each of which is composed of a circle of planning, action, and fact-finding about the result of the action, mm. which I think is the definition which has continued to today. Yeah, it's the action research cycle that yeah. you see in every book in slightly different form. Yeah, cycle. Or, I mean, or what, I, what you see also these days is the spiral Mm. Oh yes, yeah. um, which but which is something that Kurt Lewin talked about in 1946. Mm. Um, and maybe we can come back later to different ways of visually con conceiving of action research because that seems to be a big a new robberus uh, uh, <laughs> right that a seems Mobius a strip a Mobius so strip yeah. sphere uh, yeah. MC Escher steps mm -hmm. all, yeah. all all could work yeah um, so I j I'm going to start with just a bit of overview of action research just as as a as a thing, not necessarily in terms of language uh, research or language learning research. Um, so I guess it's commonly used or considered a kind of problem solving uh, technique. Mm. Um, so the idea of using data and action in this, you know, what's often described as, of, as a cycle um, to, under, to understand underlying causes of any problems that might uh, occur and then using that data to try to make future predictions about how to make changes, mm. basically. Um, a couple of the sort of theories that underpin action research traditionally, uh, one is the idea of action science. Are you familiar with action science? No, it sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, so basically, this is the, the study of how humans design their actions in difficult or challenging or uh, unusual situations. Mm. Okay. Um, and... The idea that we uh, design our actions to achieve intended consequences and how the environmental variables affect the actions that we take. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then how those, the idea with action sciences, then how those governing variables are treated is connected to whether we're going through like a single loop or a double loop uh, process of learning. Right. So whether we, we learn just by doing it once 
by, by con taking those variables into consideration, or after we're doing the action, we look back at those variables and make changes again and mm. do a, a double or a second or a well, so a fourth it, loop. So basically learning is either something you do once or it's a constant process. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other theory, I guess, underpinning it, or one of the other theories, is cooperative or collaborative inquiry, mm -hmm. proposed by Josh John, sorry, John Heron in 1971. But this is just the basic idea of research with rather than on people. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff that I read around action research, not necessarily connected with um, language teaching, seemed to emphasize the cooperative nature of it or the, the community of practice nature of it, which is something I feel is a little bit in contrast to what the way the teachers often do action research. Mm. Um, and maybe we can come back to that as a, not a criticism, but as a issue that some teachers face with action research, the sort of how it's often framed as a solitary right. mm -hmm. um, practice. Okay, uh, so maybe before I get too deep into the, well, the description of action research, have either of you ever done any action research? I think we've all, we all have to like, a certain extent, haven't we? I mean, even if it's just like um, things in class, like, <clears throat> like if we have some thing in class we want to test out, mm -hmm. we try it, go back, think about it, yeah. make a change again, you know, that's... On a very small level, that's action research. But does it have to start with a problem, though? Is that inherent in the definition of action research? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm wondering if, yeah, if you go in with a problem or a problem presents itself. Mm. I don't, I'm yeah, not I, sure, don't, not sure I don't think, I think uh, problem solving, it doesn't have to be problem solving, right. basically. Um, that's there, needs, a, there needs to be some sort of gap, though, right? There needs to be a, a gap in knowledge, at least. That's why you do the research, to address... Yeah, uh, sure. Address a question. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it, it, I mean, it could just be you you have an idea for a new activity, mm -hmm. and then you're going to apply an action research model to how you implement and try to refine that activity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I, I, I think, as, as Matt said, we've all done it. Like, I guess the most formalized way that I've done it is, um, I, we talked about this way, way back years ago, yeah. um, when I had a, a blind student in my class, mm. and I had to try out different things to see what would work to make the the lesson suitable for that student. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, the, there's that which I, I feel is more of a formalised approach to action research, but then at a very basic level it seems like action research is just sort of trying stuff out, seeing what works, mm -hmm. which everyone does naturally and normally anyway. Okay, yeah. I wonder if it needs to have some conditions in place to be actual action research. Like, there mm. needs to be an experimental condition. You know what I mean? Like, mm. So you're testing it. You're testing your hypothesis against something, right? Mm, sort of. In order to formalize so it, if you, if you right. make it all right. So you formalized versus less formalized. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that that is basically what it is. Like some people, when they hear about action research, just say well, that's something that any good teacher does. Mm. But maybe it is the level of formality yeah. in terms yeah. of yeah. the the data that you collect. Mm. I'd um, also say like it comes out of a reflection, right? Because if everyone, oh, yeah. we all have reflections. Yeah. But, um, well, if you then follow up on those yeah, things, yeah. you know. Right. So reflecting is, is considered an important stage of, yeah, yeah. of action research. Mm. Uh, so some reasons that teachers do action research. Um, one, to help them notice what students are actually doing rather than just what they think students are doing. So collecting data on that. Um, just general feedback on whether or not something is successful. Um, maybe also individualizing your teaching to particular groups of students, mm -hmm. particular settings. Um, even just, uh, it's motivational, you know, some, some teachers, if they find they're in a rut just to try something different and to look at the outcomes of that, right. um, could be a, a reason for action research. So the, I'm going to just go through the four basic, um, steps of action research. Uh, first is to plan. So either identifying a problem, um, or introducing some kind of change or difference to the classroom, um, thinking about, uh, you know, reflecting, uh, maybe just, yeah, reflecting on why that problem is happening, if it is a problem, um, theorizing about or anticipating what the effect that any change you're going to have is going to make in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you, once you've identified, part of the planning problem is when you've identified a problem, if that's what it is, thinking about a solution and then how you're going to implement it. Um, the next part is the action part of it, um, which is obviously a very important part, um, where you're actually implementing your solution or your activity. Stage three is observing, 
with basically collecting data. And then stage four is reflecting, um, mm. looking at that data to decide what effect your action had. So I remember when I spoke to Anne Burns, she said that reflection should be kind of above all of those stages. She said that we often reflect at the end, but what we should really be doing is reflecting on our plan, reflecting on the act of collecting, and reflecting on the observations we're making. Okay. I think she kind of said that it shouldn't be left to the end or the beginning. It should be... That should be throughout. documented throughout the process mm. as well. Yeah. I think a lot of, like, qualitative researchers do that, right? They sort mm. of... We have to, sort of reflexivity. Yeah, 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 reflexivity. Right? Yeah, it's different to reflection, I guess, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, so there's there's a few in the in that in those four steps. There's a few different um, ways that it, each of those steps can be more or less formalized. I guess, mm, mm. Um, especially in the well, maybe less in the action because that's that's actually doing it. But maybe maybe like you say, reflecting while you're acting. Yeah, if that's what yeah. Anne Burns was getting yeah, at. Could yeah, be a way of formalizing so. it a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. But in terms of um, planning the action. Mm. You know, how far do you write that down? How, how far do you document mm. what you intend to yeah. do? Do you document anticipated problems and solutions, all that kind of stuff? Um, the evidence gathering stage is that, are you actually, you know, collecting qualitative or quantitative um, evidence? Is it just, you know, from memory, just observing and thinking, yeah, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. you know, I'll remember to think about that later. Yeah. Um, and then the reflecting, um, again, do you write it up? Do you just think about it and then think, oh, I'll try something different. So I think mm. doing those things in a more formalized way is what would make it quote-unquote action research. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it is a level of formalization. Basically, I think so. Right. Yeah. I would have thought as well that <clears throat> maybe this is a whole other thing, actions research, like... Because I, I get the feeling that some people do this action research just so that they get a check on the CV... They write it up, but they don't really make any big mm-hmm. changes. They just do it for the sake of they have to for a certain reason. Yeah, it's not actioned. It's not um, presented. It's not kind of um, disseminated amongst peers or whatever. It's just kind of done and put away in a book or, or yeah, journal. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. So I think one of the criticisms or one of the dangers that teachers can fall into with action research, like you say, is. Maybe they, they're told, oh, do some research. And they think, well, act- action research is just a slightly more formalized version of what, of what I'm already doing as yeah, a teacher. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll just do that and call it action research or, or call it a bit, a bit of research. And then the other issue, I guess, is also maybe not thinking too carefully about when you're going to, like, how you're going to implement these four stages. So deciding when you're going to collect evidence um, do you collect it after you've tried an activity once, after you've done it for a semester? Um, do you then make a change just because that's part of action research and that you're expected to make a change? Mm. You know, what if it worked well? What if you want to try it with a different group of students? Mm. Action research, I think if you're, if you haven't thought it through carefully or if you haven't really re- reflected on the goals of the action research, mm. there is a danger of just making changes for the sake of it mm. um, and going through these stages just for the sake of it. Right. Mm. Into, I was I was just thinking about the formality. Yeah. Are, th- are there any kind of ethical considerations with doing action research? Because mm-hmm. if you if you're doing something just to teach because you think it's going to be for the benefit of, of your students, mm. then that's one thing. Mm. But if you're doing something with the intention of you know you're 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 separating students into groups and you're trying something out with one group and not with another and you're going to present it to people later on, uh-huh. then that's a piece of research you need a, you need you know to to get. Sort of your students' consent, I would say. But then, you know, like, that if you, kind of thing. If you yeah. but like going back to but, my section last time, that becomes exploratory. Then, if you if you invite the students into that, mm. what you're doing, and kind of involve them a little bit, and here's what here's what we're doing, that might skew your research results, maybe. But mm. um, but now we're talking about research results, which seems like yeah. really formal. I mean, then you're getting into I mean, like I was, science. I was going to say, I was going to say, do you think this is the wrong term? Like, do you th- or do you think it's a misleading term for teachers? Like, to call um, it research? Yeah, because like, uh, have you like Alan? Is it Alan Malley? Malley? Mm-hmm. He he talks about how he thinks the whole word research should we should stop using that for teachers and, and just use in- inquiry instead, mm. and kind of differentiate between research and, and teacher research or whatever. Kind of. But at the same time, research just means research. You know, mm. like. 
The, right. the fact that one, <clears throat> one set is extremely formalized scientific research, another set might be kind of qualitative research, another set might be action research. Mm -hmm. Like, I think giving you them. You don't have to elevate research into something that, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's research in that you are collecting some kind of data. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. analyzing that data to some extent, yeah. you know, or for some yeah. purpose. Um, but that is, I mean, what we picked up is a, one of the tensions that apparently exists in all forms of action research, which is um, whether it's driven more by the researcher's agenda or the participants mm, there. Right, right. Um, and so, but yeah, maybe connected to what I was saying earlier about how, um, because it's often presented in, as, a, as a cycle or as a, 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 you know, a spiral, a cycle, which each time it hits back on that first step, it's, it's supposed to have elevated the activity or elevated mm. something somehow. Right. And so it has this perception that, you know, each time you're going through this thing, you're improving it and you're, you know, it's getting better and better and better um, just by making changes to it right. you know, based on, um, and it doesn't, and I'm sure, you know, um, strong practitioners of action research will acknowledge that, you know, it's, it, it's not always about improvement, mm -hmm. but I think that is about, that is often how it's presented to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it's not, I mean, maybe it's about understanding rather than improvement. Just trying to get a deeper understanding every time you make a change. Like, yeah, yeah. So maybe that's what it should be redefined as. Right, right. And I was I was trying to explain our action research to somebody recently, and as I was explaining explaining it, the, the just the model of a, the cycle or even the spiral felt kind of off. Mm. I mean, this idea that you come back to this this new step, and then so I'm I'm not sure why it can't just be looked at as like a sequential series of you know, plan something, do it, collect data, reflect on it. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not, the mm. cycle thing, I guess, came about because it's, you're kind of repeating the same four steps. But mm. why is that in a circle rather than just sequential? Well, I said, I said earlier as a joke, a Mobius strip. But mm. actually, it's, it's quite nice because it's got peaks and troughs. And, uh -huh. you come, mm. it, and it, it's got the cycle of action. And, you know, there's, there's suggestions of improvement, but it doesn't, it's not like ultimate improvement or definite improvement. Mm -hmm. So I think that's good. Researchers, writers, <laughs> take that. You yeah. can have that for free. Yeah, yeah. I always look at the microphone when I'm talking to the audience. It's weird. <laughs> I can not see their faces. They should their... paint uh, <laughs> eyes and a mouth on it. <laughs> um, all right, that was this episode's Tuffle Culture Action Research. Tuffle Pioneers. Okay, so for this week's Tuffle Pioneer, I'd like to talk about Otto Jespersen. Okay who I'm surprised we haven't talked about already. I, th I feel like his name has come up, or he's, he's, he's run in some of the, the same circles as yeah, previous pioneers. Yeah, yes, which I'll talk about. Yeah, yeah, there's a few familiar names. I, I've here. got a couple of his books that I inherited oh, right, from a cool. uh, professor okay. who passed away ah, on my shelf. Cool, okay. I haven't read them, but... <laughs> okay. I, I read a few, some of them. Well, some extracts. I'll show you later as well. Um, so he's a Danish, well, was a Danish linguist. Mm -hmm. And I've put here, just to remind myself... Uh, not to be confused with the Norwegian actor of the same name who stars in 2010's Troll Hunter. Oh, it's a great film. <laughs> yeah, I remember we watched it. I remember we watched I've it. I've got the DVD. So yeah, not, not to be confused with, uh -huh. uh, with that guy. Um, he's been described as an, an internationalist, a progressivist, and a rationalist. Mm. That's the, the Danish linguist, not the actor. Right. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why that's the case, or was the case today. Um, so he lived. He lived between. Just keep emphasizing. That. <laughs> we know he's dead. <laughs> yeah. um, so he lived between 1860 and 1943, dying at the age of 82 in Roskilde in mm -hmm. Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, he, so I'll go into his background first, and then his contributions. And there's a lot of them, so I've, I've uh, cherry picked some of the more interesting ones. So he first studied at the University of Copenhagen in 1877. Uh, specialising in law, before in 1887 turning his attention to language with an MA in French. Okay. And he also studied English and Latin as uh, like secondary subjects, mm. but French was his major. Um, he supported himself through his studies by being a school teacher, mm. and also he was a shorthand reporter in the Danish Houses of Parliament. I was like, doing like the little... Dashes and lines and dots. And yeah, is, is that what it is? I yeah. So, yeah. Sure. Have you ever, mm -hmm. I, 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 I um, was looking into doing journalism studies at university. And oh, yeah, right. it's like that. 
So you're you're recording what people are saying, but v- very quickly. Yeah, and so if they, like they've got different abbreviations, different words. It's like lines and That's dots. Interesting. And okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, he did that for a bit of cash on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, after his MA, he travelled around Europe, and this is where he met the likes of Henry Sweets, mm. who were around at the same time. Um, after he sort of met Henry Sweet in, when he went out to Europe, or he went to the UK and Germany, but he was already in Europe, of course. Um, <laughs> Um, he returned to Denmark to complete his doctoral studies on the English case system. Mm. Um, and I've Wait, put, is, that, is that law or linguistics? Well, I put in brackets, <laughs> I put in brackets grammatical. Okay. Uh, good. Um, yeah. yeah, just to remind myself. Uh-huh. Again. Um, but I think he's focused on syntax. In, in another thing I read, it was all about syntax. But, mm. um, so his contribution, so just to contextualise his life, um, it was said that he was working within the 19th century pan-European reform movement in modern language teaching. Mm. Apparently, so <clears throat> I think like histo- like ELT historians like Howard and maybe Richard Smith yeah. have uh, tried to kind of give like uh, er- names to the eras, mm-hmm. and this was one of those eras. Yeah, the reform movement usually gets like a big section in, yeah, these, in these books. Yeah. Do you know why? I mean, do you know about this movement? Do you know why that was a... A little bit, but not a huge amount. So it was a, it was a time when, it, basically, it was a time when the pedagogical emphasis shifted away from traditional topics like grammar and literature towards a practical command of modern spoken language. Mm. So that was the big, big reform, basically. Movie. When did this happen? Um, well, he was working at the kind of the turn of the century. Mm. So. I thought the reform movement was before that. I thought Vietor was part of the reform yeah, yeah, movement. Yeah, so Vietor right. was mentioned later. So okay. they, they worked together. Mm-hmm. Right, right, so right. They, I think they influenced each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was kind of the, the general gist of the movement. Um, and it was from this era that his book, um, brief A Brief English Grammar, there's a longer title, but mm. it was... Let's just call it... <laughs> a longer English grammar. <laughs> no, it's got A Brief English Grammar. Um <laughs> In in uh, Danish, it's Kofordet uh, Engelsk Grammatik. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. A brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there's a well, there's a longer title. <laughs> yeah, it was published, um, and it's said to be an important foundational work. This was one of his first books, but it's supposed to be very important even to this day. Couldn't find it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't find any copies of it. I think they've renamed it in, in more recent times, mm. annoyingly. Um, so this apparently this book is one of the earliest examples of Europe in Europe of learning material produced according to phonetic principles mm. and inspired the likes of Wilhelm Vietor, mm-hmm. apparently. So, there, yeah, like I said, there wasn't too many examples from this book, but I found a free version of his Essentials of English Grammar book Mm-hmm. from 1933, 10 years before he died. And um, even then, he was still writing some of his um, ideas about uh, sound being used to teach the English language. So I'll read a quote. It's quite long. In our so-called civilised life, print plays such an important part that educated people are apt to forget that language is primarily speech, chiefly conversation, while the written and printed word is only a kind of substitute in many ways a most valuable, but in other respects a poor one, for the spoken and heard word. Many things that have vital importance in speech, stress, pitch, colour of the voice, thus especially those elements which give expression to emotion rather than logical thinking, disappear in the comparatively rigid medium of writing. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you an idea of his views on that we should be teaching spoken English. Yeah, I mean this is the this is before the development of emojis, obviously. Which <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't foresee that yeah. coming, did he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that the, those people, those people around that time, when they started putting the emphasis on, you know, spoken communication. Yeah. And you know, a recognition that that that's maybe the the, the key form of communication in terms of language. Um, they're, they're obviously aware of you know metalinguistic things and, and all that kind of stuff but they en- I think they their entry point was phonology mm. Mm. which mm. maybe now we wouldn't see as, as being the most important aspect of well then they started seeing things as it, it was like a scientific approach and that was the thing that you could kind of document yeah. and write yeah, yeah. down and investigate and get empirical evidence of yeah, and yeah. stuff yeah. 
Yeah. He he saw sound as being kind of intrinsic to... Well, he saw form as being intrinsic to meaning or function. Mm. And the way that things were articulated, he found that to be more interesting than the, the like I said, the rigid thing itself. He, mm. he felt it was more nuanced, maybe. Um, so following on from his 1885 book, do you remember the name of that? Brief. A brief. Brief English of Grammar, yeah. yeah. In, um, <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> in 1887, in along Danish. with other scholars working within this educational paradi- paradigm, um, and he joined a society, he joined many societies as, as they did back then, mm-hmm. um, and this one was called the Kuesk Tandem Society. Mm. No idea what that means. It might be a Danish thing, maybe, I don't know what they do there. Um, he presented four basic principles of language teaching reform. So his first one was the use of ordinary, everyday spoken language presented through the medium of phonetically transcribed texts. So using, rather than using written forms, um, presenting it phonetically. Mm. Um, The use of connected foreign language texts in the classroom, not disconnected sentences. Yeah, Um, discourse. um, Yeah, Um, the inductive teaching of grammar. Mm-hmm. And number four, the replacement of translation exercises by retells, free composition, and extended reading. Mm-hmm. So this was back yeah. in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah, that word came up: extensive reading. And when was actually, no, sorry, it's, it's extended reading. But yeah, uh, yeah. you know, when, when was the old communicative revolution? <laughs> <laughs> what a revolution! <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving out. So that so that was his first contribution. Um, his ideas that I just said. Um, moving ahead in the 1890s, another idea he is known for was his development of a system of signs to represent sounds without the use of the alphabet. Because mm. up until that point, they were still using the alphabets. And I think they were kind of limited to what typewriters could do mm-hmm. at the time. So he wanted to develop a, a system of code where they didn't have to rely on the alphabet, mm-hmm. basically. Um, I think Henry... No, it wasn't Henry Sweet. He was related to one of those. Mm. That was alphabetical. Right. Okay. But, mm. yeah. um, he was involved in creating the Phonetic Teachers Associations, one of which would go on to become the International Phonetics Association, mm. mm-hmm. IPA. The A means alphabet now. Yeah. Does it? Yeah. Um, International <laughs> Phonetic <laughs> Alphabet. Right, right, which right, is the right, set of. Right, but it, yeah. It, it, yeah, it came from those people. So I've got an example of here of what some 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 of the ways he proposed for the codes you can see here for the mm-hmm. high level tone he's got like a well how would you describe that it's like a like a one yeah or like a square bracket with the bottom missing yeah um for the middle level tone that looks like an equals symbol mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. others look like kind of commas and yeah. hyphens yeah, and that kind of thing yeah so they were these still, are just for tones yeah so i think yeah. they were still using things that they could replicate on a typewriter do you think this might maybe have been not, influenced not sure. by his work as a shorthand typist? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. maybe was, I was being serious. I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Never. Yeah. No, I mean, nobody really sort of commented on that, but that mm. could be the case. It's yeah. my next paper. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jespersons. <laughs> <laughs> so I've written a little note to myself here, taking stock on these two areas. I think he clearly felt that oral articulations of language should be foregrounded, and he wanted to pioneer new ways to capture these nuances. Mm. Um, and I think he put importance on sound and sense. And apparently, in his later works, he began to talk about form and function. Mm. So I think he started to use... I think these words were already in common parlance at the time, maybe? I'm not, yeah. I'm not too sure. Um, seeing function as fundamental to form. Um, and unlike many others at the time, he also had a view of language development, that language doesn't decay over time, but progresses and generates further clarity. Mm. Apparently, there were a lot of German neo grammaticalists. Again, he, he didn't live to see emojis. <laughs> <laughs> um, who said that language decays over the more it's used, it decays and it changes and it's not it's not pure. I think that's what they they kind of mm. felt at the time. Maybe. Mm-hmm. But, well, well, I mean, you said that he talked about it, in, like improving or becoming clearer. Yeah. And then, yeah. but then the others talked about it decaying. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I think the way he. But they they yeah. they were both aware of the the changes that. But they're also both thinking fallaciously that it's moving in one direction or the other as opposed yeah, yeah. to just changing but staying at the same right, level right, of right. expression. I mean, yeah, like, think... or changing through decay and mm. you know folding back in on itself and. But do, so. decay though, it, it seems. I know it has strange. a pejorative, you yeah. know, meaning, but there's an aspect I think of decay. What, what do you mean by decay? 
Uh, Sorry, Matt, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the idea of, I mean, I don't know, if, maybe decay is not exactly the right word, but of, for example, words lo- losing strength and losing meaning, mm-hmm. and that being a way that, <clears throat> you know, um, new meanings are created, or even, you know, new grammar is created. Right, right, right. That's okay. Okay. I think he felt that I've written here. I think he felt that the more that forms, like forms or the sound of forms, were catalogued and expressed, the more that clearer meanings would kind of come about over time. Mm. Maybe that's why. That was my view on that. Maybe I'm not sure if that's right. But right. Um, and he had a number of other contributions. However, uh, the last one I want to talk about is his interest in international auxiliary languages, mm. which he had a lot of work mm. in. Um, a quote here that he said, uh, primitive speech, d- does that make sense? Yeah, like natural, natural lang- occurring Natural language. So mm-hmm. primitive speech was certainly not, as is often supposed, distinguished for logical consistency, nor, so far as we can judge, was it simple and facile. It's much more likely to have been extremely clumsy and unwieldy. Mm-hmm. Wieldly. Wield- no, wieldy. Wieldy. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so he, he worked on the... <laughs> He worked on the development of Esperanto, mm-hmm. um, which we, I think we've talked about in the past, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we've talked about Esperanto. Not. We've talked about other... We've talked about interlingua. Yeah, other languages. Yeah. But yeah. And he, want, he reformed Esperanto. He made an offshoot called Idu. I-D-O, Idu. Mm-hmm. Okay. Could be a Danish word. I've heard that. Um, and after World War One, he began work on his own auxiliary language called Novial. Mm. Um, based on early, based on Idu, basically. Novio was, Nova obviously means new, and IEL, International Auxiliary Language. Hmm. So put them together and that's what Novio means, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, his ideas on Novio were published in, ni- in his 1928 book, An International Language. And um, if you go on uh, Wikipedia, there's a whole kind of list of um, aspects or features of this language. Mm-hmm. I'll just read you a couple. So... For, like, infinitives, such as to protect in English, he's just got protect, but it's spelled differently. Mm -hmm. Um, Presumably, uh, like, with a lot of these languages, they realise that you don't need C. Yeah. Actually, no, yeah. So he's got got the alphabet here, and it's A, B, C, H, D, E, F, G. So they've got C, H. Yeah, so they miss out. Yeah, like you said, they miss out. They've got A, B, C, H, D, E, F, G. C, H is one... Yeah, as one sound, and the okay. the um the IPA phone in they use is ch or yeah, yeah the ch sound uh-huh. for that, and they've also got sh too, which yeah. is the same sound apparently, according to this. There's no difference in sh and ch in this uh, language. Seems wasteful. Seems, yeah, seems wasteful. Um, but m- maybe what he's done is he's built in some redundancies to make it a more natural language. Yeah, that's what what I think one of you said in a previous episode like when someone invents a, like mm. a fake language for a TV show then imagine a couple of Exactly, yeah. 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 generations down. Yeah. So that I mean that's some of his he does have a, many more contributions. So but I think like his main ones were that he was interested in sound, he was interested in interested in progressing, progressing mm-hmm. education and kind of turning the focus away from the the rigidness, I guess. Anyway, so that's uh, today's TEFL pioneer, Otto Jespersen. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. Um, don't forget, there are lots of ways you can get in contact with us. You can email us, of course, at gmail.com, teflology at gmail.com. Um, you can listen to all of our previous episodes on our website, teflology podcast.com. Um, as you're listening to this, um, we presume that you've subscribed. But if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. And also rate and review us at the same time. Um, if you're interested in um, in supporting the podcast financially, um, why not buy our ebook, yeah. which the title well, is... Well, also because it's a good read. Yeah. Yeah, you can learn something about professional development. Yeah, it's, an, it's in fact titled Podcasting yeah. and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers available from Amazon... And is it anywhere else? It's just Amazon. Just Amazon yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Or Amazon. Yeah. Um, and uh, we also have a Facebook page, uh, which you can like. Um, and if you do like our Facebook page or rate and review us on iTunes, that helps push the podcast up. Um, so we'd very much appreciate that. And also, if you, if you have any like comments on our show, like mm-hmm. I think some of our listeners have wanted to... Um, kind of comment or have a have a forum for commenting what we talk about so Mm. um, if there's anything you hear that you uh agree 
disagree with. <laughs> yeah, if we've like got them wrong, then pick us up on it. Well, if there's just well, any, anything... Within reason. <laughs> or if anything sort of piques your interest, just um, yeah. type type that down somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Online. Put it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Facebook is probably a good place for that. Yeah. And also suggestions for future topics. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we're on Twitter as well, so that's a, a nice quick way to get in touch with us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye.